This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, we've already spoken in the last lecture about the different levels of planning and the um, information requirements and the information systems available to help uh, the people doing the planning. Uh, the next bit is looking specifically at the risks involved when we've got um, you know, our data on computer. And um, just let's run down the list, have a brief chat about each. I think they're all reasonably obvious. Uh, but the risk of hardware theft and damage, people often tend to forget this. They keep backups of data, um, which I'll come to later in the list. But what happens if all, if a computer goes down, it doesn't matter how many backups you've got of the data, if the computer fails, you've got a problem. And there is always that risk. And when we talked in the previous chapter about reducing, avoiding whatever risk, you know, businesses need to make backup plans for hardware. Either have spare hardware sat there that can immediately be put in place if um, a computer fails, uh, or have arrangements with the suppliers that they can instantly deliver a replacement if one fails. Or even to extreme, I'll tell you a short story. My sister uh, worked for a company, uh, or does work for a company, uh, which has their offices in the centre of um, Manchester, a city. And it's many years ago now, but there was a bombing and although their offices weren't damaged, the police sealed off the city for a week. And they couldn't get to the computers, they couldn't get to the data. But they'd already got arrangements in place with another office in another city, which had spare computers there, specifically in case there was ever a problem. They'd got backups of all the data in this other city. It was transmitted uh, overnight, every night, by uh, over the phone lines. And so, even though they couldn't get to her office, everything could carry on running in this other office in another city. Anyway, that's a bit over the top, maybe, but um, it's something that needs to be thought about. It's a risk. It's one that we can take steps uh, to avoid having spare computers and the like. Um, we need to consider it. Uh, data corruption, obviously faults in all sorts of ways, can cause the data to be corrupted and damaged. Well, the obvious solution there is we should keep regular backups and not just one set of backups, have two or three sets of backups. Uh, because, you know, we may not find data as being corrupted, we may not find out for a few days. And if you've only one backup that was taken yesterday, that backup is corrupted as well. Uh, operational errors, erroneous input. Obviously, the data is only as good as what's been typed in. And so all decent software will have checks built in that, ooh. Clearly, if you're supposed to be entering numbers, we're entering accounting data, then the software must be written in such a way that if you accidentally hit a letter key, uh, that it rejects it. I mean, that, that's a silly one. But the more checks are built into the software, you know, if the maximum wages we ever pay uh, to any employee are um, 100 a week, then the software should um, reject any input if we try and input more than 100. Uh, fraud, industrial espionage, could tie in with the last one, hacking, but um, most decent transaction processing software will automatically be keeping a log file which the user doesn't notice, it's not evident, you know, if you're just uh, inputting, you input away quite happily. But what you don't realise is it's keeping this log file on the computer 
making a note of every time anything's input, what time it was input, and who it was who input it, or whose computer it was that input it. And somebody should review those logs because if data is being input at two o'clock in the morning, then unless the business normally is working at two o'clock in the morning, most businesses, of course, that shouldn't be happening. Why is data being input at two? And if somebody's reviewing this file regularly, as soon as they see somebody's input at two, they can go and speak to the relevant person and see if they genuinely were inputting and there was a good reason. Or has somebody somehow broken in and you know then there is the risk of fraud, obviously. Uh, viruses, well, I have not gone there, we all know what we're talking about with viruses. Uh, and obviously, I talk whether we can completely avoid it's another matter, but certainly uh, having uh, virus checkers would be automatic. Hacking, I've already mentioned, but hacking is when unauthorised people are breaking into our system. Uh, we must make sure we've got all steps, take all steps we can to stop that happening. And of course, we've got that log file I referred to to actually find out if it is happening. Um, a slightly different tack is Data Protection Act on the rest of this page. Um, in that, by law, the Data Protection Act 1998 in the UK, but they're similar throughout Europe and in most countries, in fact, uh, protect individuals' data which is being held on computer. It only uh, relates to individuals' data, not company data. But clearly, lots of businesses have data about you. Uh, SEMA will have data on the computer with your uh, name and address, phone number, whatever else. And the trouble is, lots of companies, for different reasons, hold data about you. Supermarkets, if you've got a loyalty card, they know what you've been buying. And there is a huge danger of the data being misused and people sharing data when you don't want them to. Uh, and data getting stolen. You know, there's so much held about your computer, you know, medical um, information at uh, doctors. The banks obviously got financial information about you and so on. Uh, and so the Data Protection Act, uh, look what it says there, I mean, there's a, a lot in this act, but the main thrust of it, all individuals have the right to take legal action against any organisation that has unauthorised access or improperly used their personal information. <coughs> Putting it the other way around, companies by law have to protect information about individuals. They want to protect their data anyway, we've just been mentioning, but by law they've no choice. Any data about individuals has to be uh, protected. Uh, they, it has to be uh, kept confidential. They're not allowed to share it with other businesses without permission of the user, of the, uh, the individual. Um, individuals have the right to request details of information held about them. And if, uh, if you ask what information is held about you and any of it's wrong, the company has to correct it. Uh, if they fail to provide, uh, comply with the data protection laws, they can be prosecuted and so on. Uh, but, although I've already said any company wants to protect its data for its own benefit, I repeat, they have to, by law, protect data that's held about individuals. Now, I'm not going to say more there, but um, there is, if you want to uh, follow that link, there's more information there you should be able to read about. Uh, over the page, uh, big data. Now, I'll let you read the detail there yourself 
But let me give you an example of what, what it relates to. Open tuition uh, uses Google Analytics. And it is quite extraordinary the information that's being collected about people who are using open tuition. Now, not individually, but in total. So what I'm getting at is we can look up and see how many people are using open tuition analysed between regions of the world or even countries of the world. We can find out what proportion of users are using different types of computer uh, in the sense of using um, a Windows computer or using an Apple computer. Again, not by individual. We can't track any one individual. That data's not there. But there's all sorts of information. I say where people are coming from, what type of computer they're using, what age range they're in, what proportion of people using us are in the uh, between 20 and 25, between 25 and 30. There's a huge amount of information, which of course, less for us because we're not charging, but for businesses, information that could be terribly useful in making decisions about where to target, that sort of thing. And you see, information is being collected anonymously about you all over the place. Um, information about websites you visit, the cookies that you collect, information from mobile phone companies um, about where people are ringing from. Masses and masses of information. Again, and not anonymously, I repeat, the information we can access about our users doesn't tell us about any individual users, there's no names attached. But this is what we mean by big data. The masses of structured and unstructured information that's collected and stored every moment through mobile phones, websites, social media and various other electronic sources. Um, you've got there about the, the sheer volume of it. Uh, the speed, the variety of data, and veracity. You know, one problem with making use of this sort of data, the big data, is that um, it, well, it may be in or inaccurate in its raw form. It depends how it's being used and how it's being collated. Uh, the benefits, you can get competitive advantage if you're able to analyse and correctly interpret. That's the point I was making a minute ago. The risk, uh, this data protection business, that, you know, the information we're able to access is all completely anonymous. But if ever there's any way it can be tracked down to an individual, then there are potentially big problems. That's why you've got data protection authorities looking into it. And they are, this business of the data being misleading or misinterpreted. Um, I said we could see what percentage of our users come from different regions of the world or even individual cities. In fact, it's where they're logging in from. So just because you live in a particular city doesn't mean that you might not be being routed into the internet via a different city. If I'm making sense there, or even a different country. Um, so it, it can give misleading information, you've got to be careful. Now, finally, evaluation of information systems, a slightly different tack here. But um, information systems obviously tend to be big expenditure the hardware, the software, getting software specially written, and that sort of thing. Um, and so Decisions about installing new computer systems are similar to decisions of buying a new machine. You know, and ideally you look at net present value and things. But the one huge problem with evaluating um, information systems for computers is that whereas with machines, 
if we're producing a new product obviously you've got we're revenue which you'll forecast and match against the costs um, with information systems most of the benefits are not measurable in financial terms you see they be, it says here usually beneficial in terms of speed ease of use security of data but it's very hard to measure how much that's worth to us. We can measure the costs. We know how much it's, the equipment's going to cost, the training, etc. They're relatively easy to measure, uh, but it's just the fact that the benefits tend to be, so many of them tend to be intangible, uh, which makes cost benefit analysis, MPV uh, methods less useful if we can't measure the benefits. Um, so you'll see the last paragraph, perhaps you use balanced scorecard approach, which we mentioned in um, uh, one of the earlier chapters. Or try to uh, uh, assign a financial value, but as I've already said, it's totally impossible to measure uh, the benefits. Okay.